Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good day. My name is Tony Zockwitz, the messenger, and I pray peace to you, your family, friends, and whoever comes in contact with you. Amen. And I'm um, happy to announce we have Brian Mercier back with us as the evangelist. You like that title, by the way? I don't, <laughs> yeah, I just well, gave it to you. <laughs> well, thank you. I think that's what you do, you know. <laughs> Ed, I do. I do apologetics and evangelization. Well, that's great. So, so I kind of nicknamed you without your permission last week, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was appropriate. but So if you want to change it, we can do that later on. So what we're going to talk about tonight, we, you know, Brian, you, you and I discussed it a little bit. We're going to talk about how someone becomes a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and probably with the, the, this could apply to outside the church, I'm sure, you know, just not restricted to Catholicism, you know. Um, and then I want, I want to start off, though, reading a thing about Fatima. In uh, an article I stumbled across, I guess I downloaded this a few weeks back, but I came across it today, just before the program. And it's the Fatima visionary predicted the final battle would be over marriage and family. Our Lady of Fatima, credit credit uh, Joseph Ferreira, Our Lady of the Fatima in L.A., the archdioc- archdiocese there, mentions uh, Mexico City, Mexico, December 31st, 2016, actually at 2.33 p.m. Uh, it was on EWTA, EWTN News. Sister Lucia dos Santos, one of the three children who witnessed the Marian apparitions at Fatima, died in 2005. But before her death, she predicted that the final battle between Christ and Satan would be over marriage and the family. So says Cardinal Carlos Caferra, who reports that the visionary sent him a letter with this prediction when he was Archbishop of Bologna, Bologna, it's B-O-L-O-G-N-A. Yeah, Bologna. Italy. Yeah, Bologna, Italy. This reported statement by Sister Lucia expressed during the pontiff of St. John Paul II was visited earlier this year by Desti Le Fay from the faith, weekly of the Archdiocese of Mexico, in the midst of the debate generated by the president Yuko Penaniso, why do I get these these names? Who who announced his intention to promote gay marriage in this country, in Mexico, I guess, huh? The Mexican Weekly recalled the statements that Cardinal Gaffera made to the Italian press in 2008, three years after the death of Sister Lucia. On February 16, 2008, the Italian cardinal had celebrated a mass at the tomb of Padre Pio, after which he gave an interview with tele-radio Padre Pio. He was asked about the prophecy of Sister Lucia dos Santos that speaks about, quote, the final battle between the Lord and the kingdom of Satan, end of quote. Cardinal Caffera explained that St. John Paul II had commissioned him to plan and establish the Pontico Institute for the Studies of Marriage and Family. At the beginning of this work, the Cardinal wrote a letter to Sister Lucia of Fatima through her bishop, which he could not do it directly. Quote, and explicitly, since I did not ex- expect a reply, seeing as I had only asked for her prayers, I received a long letter with her signature, which is now in the archives of the Institute. End of quote. The Italian cardinal said, quote, In that letter we find written, The final battle between the Lord and the kingdom of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, she added because whoever works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought against and opposed in every way, because this is the decisive issue. When she concluded, nevertheless, Our Lady has already crushed his head. I find that interesting. Mm. 
Cardinal Caffera added that, quote, speaking again with John Paul II, you could feel that the family was the core, since it has, has to do with the supporting pillar of creation, the truth of the relationship between man and woman, between the generations. If the foundational pier, pillar is damaged, the entire building collapses. And we're seeing this now because we are right at the point and we know it. End of quote. Quote again. And I, am I was actually just I... talking about that today, by the way. You know, that our whole family's under attack, and because of it, uh, our schools, our culture, everything else in every sector is under attack because our family itself is under attack. I, I was just talking about that. Yeah, isn't that interesting where the affirmation comes? Yeah. So let, let me read on, quote, and I am moved when I read the bio, best biographies of Padre Pio, the Cardinal concluded, about how this man was so attentive to the sanctity of marriage and the holiness of the spouses, even with justifiable rigor at times, end of quote. The article was originally published CNA on July 8, 2016, end of, end of the uh, article. So... Now, and that's interesting. Do you see, Brian, how God works? Affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. Absolutely. You know, here I am reading it, not re realizing that you talked about it today. So that's confirmation from our Lord that he wanted that message out there. Right. So with that, I'll give you the horse reins. You can run <laughs> with it. <laughs> well, thank you. And just so our listeners know, we... Uh we're planning, in light of November 1st, which was All Saints Day, we're planning to discuss uh, saints and what it takes to be a saint in the Catholic Church. How does someone become a saint? I mean, I think one of the big misconceptions is that, you know, only a certain few people like St. Mother Teresa or St. Francis or St. Anthony, only they are saints. But in fact, the Catholic Church teaches that everybody who's in heaven is a saint. And so Amen. we're going to talk about in a few minutes, you know, about what it takes to be a saint. And we're going to give some inspirational stories of saints so we can see. A lot of times I think we need to compare our lives to the lives of the saints because they lived extraordinary lives. They lived lives of passion and purpose for Christ. They're perfect models and examples for us to follow in many ways. And so when we look at their lives, it inspires us. And in being here in uh, November the Saint Month, All Saints, I want to tell some stories of saints. Uh, I'm going to tell a few, and then we'll take a break from that, and uh, we'll pass it back to you so you can actually tell us how do you become a saint. How does a person become a fully, formally canonized saint in the Catholic Church? And then after that, I'll go back and tell uh, a few more stories. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. So you can run with it. Okay, I will. <laughs> ding, ding, the race is on. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. Um, I have a few saints that I just love to talk about, and uh, one of them is St. Patrick. The story of St. Patrick is amazing. I mean, a lot of people know St. Patrick. You know, they think of St. Patrick's Day, and they think of Ireland, and they think of beer, and they think of partying, and they think of just getting riotously drunk. <laughs> but the fact is that absolutely none of that has anything to do with St. Patrick at all. St. Patrick's Day has nothing to do with being Irish. It has nothing to do with nationalism at all, in fact. It has nothing to do with getting drunk or partying or drinking. In fact, St. Patrick himself would be rolling over in his grave the way we celebrate it. And so people are like, okay, well, if it's not about, you know, Irish or shamrocks or anything else, what is it about? And we have to realize that St. Patrick wasn't even Irish. He was actually... When oh, he got kidnapped by pirates and was brought over to Ireland, and he was a slave herder there for a long time, tending sheep, I think for six years. And his captivity lasted until he was 20 years old. And it was at that time he had a vision from God who told him to escape, run away, and be free. And he did. He ended up getting to the coast somehow and escaping on a boat back to his, uh, his own country. Now... While he was there, he had a vision from God again many years later saying that it was time to go back. It was time to evangelize the Irish people, the pagans, the people who didn't know God at all. And his, his dream, his vision was so powerful 
that he ended up going to study for the priesthood and he ended up becoming a bishop. And then he ended up going back over to Ireland <laughs> willingly to the people who kidnapped him and he preached there. And he was so powerful and he worked so many miracles. And I, uh, stories and legends say that he even met with his head captor, one of the head people in Ireland, and he converted him. And within 40 years, he converted the whole nation of Ireland, and he built schools, and he built monasteries. And it was just an amazing story of holiness with St. Patrick. Um, now, many people don't realize just what a profound impact one saint has, one person on this earth who lives for Christ has. Let me tell you an amazing story that the majority of people probably don't know. And it has to do with St. Patrick. So St. Patrick's way up in Ireland at this time. He's converting people like a flood. I mean, people are just flooding to Catholicism. They love what he has to say. You know, and he traced out the Druids, he chased out the pagans, and he's converting everyone to Christ. Now, in the rest of the Roman Empire, Jesus Christ is being attacked. And when I say attacked, in 325 AD, at the Council of Nicaea, it was the bishops there who voted on the doctrine of the divinity of Christ, known as the hypostatic union. Arius, who was a Catholic priest, was the first one in church history to say that Christ was not God. He was the first one in human history to say that Jesus was created. You know, he wasn't on the same level as God. He wasn't eternal. And that was blasphemy in the eyes of the church. The people wouldn't buy that. And so the Council of Nicaea was called to deal with this problem, and the Council of Nicaea voted overwhelmingly. I think only two bishops voted with Arius. The rest of them upheld and defended the divinity of Christ. But it was not too long after that that Arius didn't give up. I mean, he ended up talking to the emperor. He was he was really losing people, and he ended up convincing the emperor onto his side. And then the emperor ended up saying, listen, everybody needs to convert to Arianism or you're going to die or you're going to be tortured or you're going to be exiled. We just need to find unity in this uh, Roman Empire. So everyone needs to convert to Arianism. And of course, nobody's going to convert to Arianism because that is a heresy. And so they ended up starting to be driven out. They started to be tortured and exiled and imprisoned. St. Athanasius was chased out five times. St. Jerome, one of the greatest saints uh, of the whole early church, he said, one day I woke up to find that the whole entire world was Arian. I mean, at this time of the empire, 50 years later, the Council of Nicaea had put a stop to it, but they ignored it, and evil was allowed to creep in, and the whole world ended up pretty much converting to Arianism. There was only a handful of bishops left that were Orthodox, and there were only a handful of priests that were left. I mean, you could probably count them on one hand, and the whole Roman Empire was becoming dark. And if you read this great history book, uh, it's called uh, The History of Christendom, and it's by Warren Carroll, and it's six volumes, and it's just the most amazing church history read. And he says, when the whole world's dark, what happens? Three things happen. Number one, St. Athanasius helped save the church. Number two, St. Augustine helped save the church. But number three, St. Patrick, who had been converting the only part of the Roman Empire that was untouched, was converting thousands and thousands and thousands of people up there. And he created tons of missionaries. And these people poured out of Ireland like a waterfall, a raging waterfall, and just stormed into the Roman Empire, converting people back to the Catholic faith. When all hope was lost, when everything looked dismal, they came in, the Irish people. And the, that's why there's a book out there that says how the Irish saved Western civilization, because the Irish people, because of what St. Patrick did, because of one man, they came in and had a huge part in saving the Roman Empire, and they created more schools and more priests and more missionaries, and around this time, the, uh, the orders were coming in of monks and uh, sisters and nuns and people who prayed all the time, and eventually Western civilization was saved because one man. That's the power of sainthood. You'll see that in the lives of all the saints, that saints make saints. Saints 
change the world and they make a difference and that's just one man and that is why we celebrate that and that alone is why we celebrate St. Patrick's Day because it's the conversion of the Irish people to the Catholic faith that's what St. Patrick's Day is about yeah that's interesting very interesting I didn't know that he was like a slave you know oh, yeah. it feels like that Oh yeah, but, you know that's just... that's where you have to learn. You learn from the bottom up, you know, not from the top down. You you know, I mean, you have to go through life. You have to. The more experiences you have in life, the the more wisdom I believe you gain. Hopefully, you retain what happens to you in your lifetime. Right. And yeah. Don't forget and don't forget it. I mean, because it should be there to to remind you. Hey, you were once there. You went through that. That's you right. We all did. But when other yeah, it gives you compassion about those who are currently going through that. That's right. You know? His so story that, reminds me of his story reminds me of the saints here in uh the North America Shrine of Martyrs, if you go to New York, upper New York. Uh huh. Um, you know, uh, St. Francis, uh, St. Isaac Jogues and a bunch of his companions were ministering to the Native Americans who tried to kill them. And they ended up escaping, but then they felt called by God to go back and evangelize them, just like St. Patrick. But unlike St. Patrick, they ended up getting um, eaten and killed. I mean, this, the Indians ended up biting off their fingers one by one, and they're just the cannibalism and the barbarianism yeah. of some of these Americans were unbelievable. But they went back and they preached the word of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what saints do, that their only concern is heaven. Their first concern is heaven. Their primary concern is heaven. Their whole life revolves around Jesus. What does God want for me? What does God want? How can I build up his kingdom? Most of us think about, you know, when's my show on? How many hours of Facebook can I scroll? How many Snapchat yeah. people can I make? You know, it's like yeah. we don't have oftentimes a focus on Christ where their whole lives revolved around Christ. Yeah, exactly. And that's the only thing. And as you get older, you realize what is there but that. There's nothing else that makes any sense. You know, faith is is what you have to have. I mean, you 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 are going to be judged. We we know that. I mean, our teaching tells us we're going to be judged. And even though some of the faiths don't believe in purgatory, I can assure you, because of my personal experience, there is a purgatory, and you're going to choose it if if you're on your way to heaven. Because once you see the sight of heaven and the purity of heaven, which is made up of the love of heaven, then you're going to, you're going to not want to stain that with, you, with our ridiculous sins that we carry up, that we'll be carrying with us. And by the divine mercy, God will allow us to go into purgatory, to be purified, and then, and then, and then enter, hopefully under some time, enter into heaven. Because it's it's just it's just beautiful. I did I share that story about the greatest treasure of heaven, Brian? I don't know. I believe I know you, you did. I believe yeah, you did. About, yeah. Okay, so with the chest and stuff, right? If you want to share it for our, our our audience, that would be great. And yeah, let me let me do. Know. Yeah, yeah. So, so having an out of body, ex well, this had nothing to do with my out of body experience. As a matter of fact, about I would say about uh, four years ago, you know, I was just like doing something, not paying attention. On the right corner of my eye, um, you know, like on a peripheral vision, opened up yeah. a quarter inch by six inch strip of light, and it was the light was the was a piercing into heaven. Oh yes, I, I do remember this. You did tell this last week, yes. Okay, so so that's the purity I'm I'm referring to. We don't know what that is. We don't know. I know what it is because I I saw it, I experienced it. But but without that, we don't know what that is because guess what? We we're staying. And I don't think I have the full comprehension of it either because I was born with original sin. Right. So that has to be totally purified so that I'm not a sinner before I, I would even want to get into that because it's so beautiful. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. And from an apologetic, being an apologist myself, I would love to defend and explain the Catholic faith. That's what I've done for 20 years. It's my expertise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, throughout this show, you know, in the future, I'd love to do some apologetics. You know, how, where, how, why do we believe in purgatory? Where is it found in the Bible? 
You know, why do we yeah. believe in Mary and the saints? Where is it found in the Bible? History, scripture, tradition, you know, the whole thing. Maybe we can do that in the future. Well, we could do that. Yeah, we'll see how we make out this week. We could plan it for up, upcoming weeks. That, that yeah, sounds well, great. Let me move on to uh, St. Francis de Sales, if you don't mind. He's one yes, of my personal ahead. favorites, and he's actually the... Uh, He's actually the patron saint of apologetics. Okay. There are many, but he's one of the big ones. And St. Francis of Sales is an amazing, amazing saint that few people really know. And he wrote one of the, they say, it's the six best books, spiritual classics in the history of Christianity. And it's called uh, Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. It's, it's a must read. If you're even remotely serious about getting to heaven, then Christians mm-hmm. and our listeners, you have to read it. It's a beautiful, wonderful book. It's one of the few books written by saints that were not written for priests and nuns. These were written for lay people like us to teach us how to be holy in normal, ordinary, average, everyday life. And St. Mm-hmm. Francis de Sales is probably one of the best people to ever teach us that because he put it into practice himself and ended up becoming a saint through his own practices. So he not only speaks it, but he lives it. In fact, St. Francis de Sales had such a violent temper. Most people don't know that about him. I mean, a raging temper. But through these practices that he lays out in the book, he ended up Mm -hmm. creating such a meekness and a gentleness and a love that people he encountered didn't even know he ever had an anger problem. (laughs) In fact, when he said no to someone, they often left just as happy when he said no as if he had said yes. I mean, he just impacted everyone he came in contact with. And mm. he, he was also a great, great, great apologist. I mean, he always wanted to bring the gospel of Christ to as many people as possible. I believe when he was 30 years old, he actually volunteered to go into the Chablis region of southern France. And this is the territory where John Calvin took over after the Reformation or I should say the Protestant Rebellion, and he ended up converting a lot of France. Now, St. Francis de Sales volunteered to go in and try to convert these people back to the Catholic Church, but that was no easy feat. These people were ferocious. They were angry. They were vicious, and they wanted nothing to do with the Catholic faith. They hated the Catholic faith. And so... Francis had a really hard time. A lot of times he was chased out of lodges. He was chased out of parks. He ended up having to run for his life a few times. And sometimes because they wouldn't let him sleep over at the lodges at night, he actually had to sleep outside. And sometimes in France it gets really cold at night. A few times he had to tie himself to a tree with his belt and sleep in the tree with snow covered on the ground and snow covered on the tree. And the reason he slept in the tree is because they tried to chase him out with dogs, and they tried to kill him with dogs, and he ended up having to climb a tree to save his life. And he stayed outside all night in the freezing cold. And most people would have given up. Most people would have gone home. Most people would have said, these people, (laughs) rightly so, are crazy. You know, they they Mm -hmm. can't be converted. And, and, And he kind of realized that, too, at one point. He came to the conclusion that, you know, living a holy life and just preaching to these people isn't enough. Because he would have mass every day and not a single person would come. Did he stop? No. He was a saint. He loved Christ more than anything. And so he kept persevering and he kept persevering. And he ended up changing his tactics. He ended up writing these famous tracts, these famous pamphlets uh, on different doctrinal points of the Catholic faith. One would be on the Eucharist. One would be on the Catholic Church. One would be on baptism. And in the morning, he, got, he recruited the Franciscans to help him out. But before anyone was awake, probably around 3 or 4 in the morning, he would go to these houses and just drop off these pamphlets one by one for years. <laughs> and they were very, very well written and very compelling. And uh-huh. four, four years later, uh-huh. after all of this hard work, after all of his preaching, Slowly, two, three, four, five people started coming to Mass. People started coming up and asking him questions. And then in a very short amount of time, it was like God just worked his grace. St. Francis was so holy. He was so loving. You know, people had a hard time saying anything bad about him. And that's when God started working miracles. I mean, the floodgates opened in around uh, 1602. 
A.D. This is when he lived. When he was about 35 years old, he ended up converting thousands and thousands of Protestants into the Catholic Church. They estimate that around, by the time he died in 19, uh, sorry, 1622, 60,000 Protestants converted to the Catholic Church. 60,000. That's mm. unbelievable. It's, you can't even fathom how many people that is. But they all were converted, not only by his purity and his holiness and his preaching eventually, but all, also his apologetics and his um, refusal to give up. And I think that's what we need to do. You know, that's a great lesson for us in life, that prayer moves mountains. Perseverance oh, and yeah. not giving up moves mountains. Definitely. Yes, and he proved true. that to us, didn't he? Oh yeah, that's and it's it's true. I I've said to even my you know my associates that you know I have breakfasts. So I said you you have to preach the word of God. You have to take a stance. You know what is wrong is wrong. You got to call it for what it is. You know, right? Because if not, Jesus God, you got to stand before Jesus. He says, okay, I sent this person to you. What did you do? What did you do? What did you say? Uh, oh, I took the coin and I buried it because I was afraid <laughs> of you. Yeah, you're, you're referring to scripture now, right? Because the, it's not the coin that was buried; it was the word of God that was buried. That's what the scripture says. Right. And so he took the coin, he gave it to the one who, who tripled his amount, you know, and he says, you know, you, you're the you're the better one. You you trusted in what you're doing, and God wants you to try things. God wants you to test him. The Blessed Mother, you know, like in Fatima, when they were throwing holy water at her, she says, that's what you're supposed to do, and she smiled. Because I, Satan appeared to once as the Blessed Mother. So you could do that. And you know, when I threw the water at Satan, it burns. You know, it just right. burns. And not everybody can be an evangelist like St. Francis de Sales, you know, like me, but everybody can pray. Everybody can sacrifice. I guarantee you, That's here's true. the key. Here's the key. The holier we become, the more lives we're going to change. The holier we become, the more we're going to change the world. That's a fact. That has just been yeah. written all over history in the lives of the saints. And St. Saint Francis de Sales, he never stopped praying. He never stopped giving up. I mean, his life was holy. Not only did he convert 60,000 people to the church, but he, through his books and through his literature, people are still learning from this man today. I believe that he called, uh, uh, he read a book once called uh, Spiritual Combat. And, I, and this was a really powerful, hard-hitting book, also around the time of the Reformation. And it was part of the Counter-Reformation. He kept it in his book for 18 years, I believe, and just read it and meditated on it and thought about it. So let me ask my listeners out there, does anybody out there read spiritual reading? Do you read the Bible? Do you read the lives of the saints? Do you read spiritual books that help you grow in holiness? Because these are the quick ways to grow closer to God and to get on the path to heaven. We need to be doing spiritual reading if we're serious about our, our faith because these things teach us lessons that we would never learn in 10 lifetimes. But when you read it on the page, you're like, oh, my gosh, that makes sense. And it just comes to light. Right. That's right. That's true. You know, being a Carmelite, you know, part of an ongoing formation once you're received is that you have to study the lives of the Carmelites. And, of course, doing the program with this, of course, it, it brings me into research of everything that has to do with Christianity and Jesus. You know, right. it, goes beyond, it goes beyond the borders of Catholicism. You know, it's like... You know, Jesus, when Jesus came, what did he say? It didn't come for the righteousness. I came for, for the, those that are sinners, basically. Right. And, you know, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a paradox when you think about, I come for the righteousness. That was kind of a slap of the Pharisees and Sacristies in their face because who is right but him? You know, you know what I'm saying? I come for the righteousness. In other words, it's not for you because you think you're so right. <laughs> <laughs> I come for the what they referred to back then was the Gentiles, right? And who right. the Gentiles to or the us? sinners, the prostitutes and yeah. the tax collectors. 
I had a sneeze there for a minute. So it's like, so the Gentiles are basically, you know, I look at those outside of the, the, the Christian faith. Who are the, you know, the Muslims are Gentiles. We're Gentiles. All the other ones, they're all, we're all Gentiles in a sense. You know, they're, they're, but, you know, coming and trying to get in union with Christ, that's, that's a key thing. You've got to bring yourself in union with Christ, and the only way you do that is by studying the life of Christ. Mm. But here's the other thing that, that I, 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 like I, I mentioned to even my, my Carmelite sisters, I said, look, you, you, we're all called to become saints. We're all called to, to, to be in heaven. And you had mentioned earlier all the people in heaven are saints. That's true. So, but you don't have to copy them. God calls us for specific things to do and to, to live a life. And it doesn't have to include martyrism. But in a, kind of in a way, when you start doing this approach, you do carry another cross, don't we? Mm. You know, it's a different type of cross. But you know what? Like my wife said, when I get involved with a couple of these certain, certain people, does it, they're bad for you. And you know what? Literally, I cried. I said, you know, don't, don't take this cross from me with this person. Don't do it. Let me carry this cross. Mm. I know the person's not good, but I have to deal with this. I've got to stay with it. And I have to be his friend. Because even though he denies everything, he still looks to me, and he and he, he looks up to me, and and the only reason he could do that is because I'm trying to find, you know, follow Christ. There's no other reason to look up to me, you know. So, trying to just be a, you know, trying to help everybody, you know, and the father <laughs> exactly. to a lot, uh, trying to be a father to a lot of the younger ones, you know, who are lost, the lost sheep. Yeah, I mean that's what we're called to do. You know, well, to exactly. minister to them. Precisely. You know, so, so in you know one of the, one of the ways I do that, and I do use one of the instruments, and in, and I use the Lord's water, the miraculous water. You know, I I, I get I get a supply that comes in from France uh, through the Marius priest up in Boston, and then I give them a contribution. They send it down to me, and I break it into these little one drum vials and I you know I put a I spend a lot of time on it and a lot of money I've given away over a thousand of them you know but the reason why I did that well I the, what happens is I, when I went to a Carmelite retreat up to France and I saw St. Bernadette's body entombed in a glass you know coffin that's open to the air and her, she's been dead what since what 300 years or so mm -hmm. and her and she she's like sleeping She's beautiful. And so they say the, that her... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, that's what all the incorrupt saints are like. Uh, St. Bernadette, I think, was about 150 years ago, and she's perfectly okay. incorrupt. Yeah. Yeah, and they say her flesh is supple. She's beautiful. And then the other one I got a chance to say, these are two that really impressed me, was St. Padre Pio. Not Padre Pio, I mean St. Vincent de Paul. And I was like one foot away from his glass coffin. And I, and I describe St. Vincent de Paul as not as a handsome person. <laughs> but here's, here's the dilemma. He radiates beauty. That's right. He's a glow, you know? And I'm saying, wow. Just like St. Bernadette. I mean, she looks just like the day she died. I mean, she smells beautiful. She looks beautiful. She doesn't look yeah. like she's dead or feel like she's dead. It's amazing. Yeah, so I... So I come back from this trip. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm doing, I'm giving out, doing these vials. I start off kind of primitive, just getting the vials, put a cross on the top, and saying, "This is from Lords." You know, you know, help yourself. And they say, "Oh, what is it? Holy water?" I said, "No, don't. It's not holy water." A blessed mother was very specific. She says, "This is blessed by myself and God the Father. This is miraculous water." And Holy where water is, this is from, blessed Lord? by a, This is at Lord's, yeah, Lord's water. And and she says that the holy water is blessed by a priest. This is not blessed by a priest. It's God the Father, and, it's, and she blesses it. You see the difference? Big difference. And, <laughs> and you'll read that. Uh, if you read up Lord's, they'll tell you that the water is referred to as being miraculous. So, and I've had, and I personally 
it just seated uh, two sets of twins praying over two, two girls who were having problems with pregnancies. And then when I bought my house here in Portland, Connecticut, I, uh, I, it was in February, and I asked our attorney, young, young guy, probably in his uh, mid-40s, mid I said, how were the kids for Christmas? And he hung his head. He says, we, could, we can't have children. We went through insemination. We went to all the specialists and all that. And he's an attorney. He could afford that, right? I says, well, you haven't tried this. And I get up and I blessed his forehead, his two hands. And I said, you go home, take this vial, and bless your wife in the same way. And don't worry about it. It's not your decision. It's God's. Mm -hmm. Ten months later, he sent me a beautiful letter. They had a baby girl. You see? And that's how it works. So that yeah. ministry is what I currently do. I still do that. And, and well, it's, exactly. It's a and that's it's a the beautiful thing. We, ministry. It is a beautiful ministry. And I have my ministry, and all different people who are listening have their ministries. That's the thing. God calls us all to do something different. We're, all, we're not all called to be St. Francis of Sales. We're not all that's called right. to be Mother Teresa. We're not all called to be, you know, uh, Francis of Assisi or any of the other saints. You have your mission. That's what God's given you. And you try to do it the best you can for God with holiness, humility. And I try to do the best that I can. I know I told God 15 years ago, 20 years ago now, <laughs> sitting in the middle of a huge field with a 150-foot steel cross, and God had just turned my life upside down and backwards. And inside out, just totally put me back together again. My, and I told him that, God, I just want to heal people the way you've healed me. I want to help people the way you've helped me. And I want to help people to have a life-changing encounter with you that transforms them from the inside out, just like what happened to me, God. That's what I want. I want to bring people to you, and I want them to know your power, your love, and your mercy, and the truth of the Catholic faith that sets us free. And I've been doing that for 20 years, apologetics, evangelization, and counseling, just leading people to God, talking to people who, you know, harm themselves, talking to people with low self-esteem and anger and hurt and evangelizing every religion you can imagine, and especially Catholics, among the chief among majority yeah. of them. But the fact <laughs> exactly. is, I want to bring Jesus to as many people as possible. That's my mission. And God's recently called me to do that full time. And I believe I'm working right now on putting a business together uh, to try to do apologetics and evangelization full time to reach 50 times more people than I've reached in the past over the last 15 oh, years. I want to reach super. over the next 15 years. Yeah. yeah Just that's the beginning. Great. Yeah. We, we can use this, this, um, the messenger, you know, this program is trying to evangelize it when we are. That's what we're trying to do anyways. But we can use that to get your book out there, to get your message out there. Uh, you do have a website. You, uh, repeat that again if you want, Brian, so we could get our listeners to uh, tune into that. It's a nice website. Yeah, thank you. My website's www.catholicbrian.org because I'm Catholic and I'm Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, catholicbrian.org. And if you want to follow me on Instagram or Twitter or any of the social media sites, it's also Catholic Brian or my name, Brian Mercier. Um, if you want to bring me and to that's speak spelled B R Y A N, yes. Don't ask me why. Sure, is it? Yeah, uh, <laughs> E R C C I E R. Well, no, I, I was spelling it as uh, B R I A N, but that's not right. Correct. And it's an org. Dot I won't org. judge you. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> why not? All the other guys do, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, let me tell you one more. No, let me um, give one more yeah, quick let's get through story. One more. And then I will let you go to the, uh, what it takes to be a saint. So, okay. day out of love for God. Everybody knows Mother Teresa. But I want to yeah. highlight some of the parts of her life. I mean, saints are saints for a reason. They do little things, no matter what it is, no matter what they do. They try to do it in the most extraordinary way possible. Even St. Therese, the little flower, she said that if you pick up a piece of paper off the floor out of love for Jesus, that pleases him. So her whole mission was to do every act throughout the day out of love for God. And that kind of encapsulates Mother Teresa's life. Mother Teresa took all these mundane, everyday things that nobody else wanted to do in Calcutta, India, 
and she did them to perfection. She did them with great love. And that's what makes someone a saint, great love. I mean, if you go over to India, if you go over to these areas, they literally, this is not an exaggeration, they literally have people dying in the middle of the streets just laying there. They're already dead. And people, because it's so common, they actually walk over the dead corpses without even looking at them. It's, it's like seeing a cat here in America or a little shrub yeah. or a squirrel. We notice them, but we don't notice them. You know, they just, okay, they're there. These people actually walk over dead corpses. And the government actually leaves them there for up to four days. And on the fourth day, they'll come collect them and dispose of the body before it completely starts to rot and smell. But the fact is that Mother Teresa came in and saw each of these people with such dignity. No matter what religion they were, she saw that they were children of God created by God with an unbelievable dignity and worth. And she treated them like such. And she was so busy throughout the days trying to, get to all these people, and she created the Sisters of Charity and brought in all these little sisters to help her. And she just didn't have time to pray, you know, but one day she had a little extra time and she went and did a holy hour of adoration. And she went and prayed before the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist, and she said that gave her such a relief and a strength to keep going. She realized that she didn't, before she thought she didn't have time to pray. Now she realized that she didn't have time not to pray. <laughs> she knew she needed to pray, and so she ended up praying a holy hour in front of Jesus for two hours with her sisters every single day. Two hours yeah, of prayer. Yeah, that was mandatory. Yep. Mandatory. mandatory. And, and that's what gave them their strength to do what they did. And there's one story about uh, one guy who had an infection in his arm, and maggots were literally eating his arm away. I mean, he had bugs in his arm. And a reporter who was following Mother Teresa saw her come up to this guy, and she gently took this guy's arm and looked at it for a second. And then she took her own hand, dug it in the guy's wound, and started digging out the maggots. Now, the reporter was completely disgusted by this. And he's like, oh, lady, you could not pay me a million dollars to do what you're doing. And she stopped and she looked at the reporter in the eyes and she said, you could never pay me a million dollars to do this either. She was doing it for something greater yeah. than a million dollars, and that was yeah. Jesus Christ. When we have yeah. Jesus in focus, we do things that are extraordinary. And Mother Teresa lived an extraordinary life. And perhaps the most extraordinary thing about Mother Teresa was the fact that she was in a dark night of the soul for so many decades. I mean, she didn't feel God. Her prayers just seemed useless. She, she couldn't experience God. She, she was just such in a dark time, kind of what I experienced the last two years of my life. I have no idea how she lived with it for 40 years, but she blows me away because she still had faith to move mountains. She still did 10, 20, 100 times what most Catholics do, even though she didn't feel God. And that would be a lesson for us today that even if we don't feel God, God seems far away. He's not answering our prayers. He doesn't seem to love us. We persevere. We keep praying. We keep loving. We keep doing exactly what we think he would want us to do because that is the path to sanctity. That's the path to holiness. And for most people, eventually God comes back into your life and gives you that consolation. She was a saint. She didn't need it. She lived like a saint whether she felt like God or not. She prayed like a saint, whether she mm-hmm. felt like God or not. And she changed the world like a saint, whether she felt God or not. And that is a lesson for us all, to do little things with great love. Is there someone in our families that we haven't forgiven? Mother Teresa would say, start there. Forgive well, that person. Start, yeah, you have to start in your own family. You have to start there. And, and, I've, and I've, you know, for those of you, the listeners are out there that might have been abused for your father or your mother or uh, either whether it's a, a girl or a boy, you know, you don't have to be, you know, we're taught not, you don't have to subject yourself in front of the person because that may be too, too extreme. But you should start to pray for them because who did that was Satan, who, who, who got inside that person to do those things. You know, we're all guilty of sin to some degree, some a lot lot worse than others. But you you could start 
praying for them. It's a beginning. But I'm, Brian, you brought up a very interesting thing because I was going to mention the same thing as far as how do you become a saint. And, and you already validated by mentioning St. Teresa picking up a piece of paper. And that's exactly how you could start. When you see scrap on the ground, pick it up and put it in the, in the in proper disposal. If you, if you go shopping, bring, put your carriage back where it belongs. Don't leave it out in the middle of the parking spot. Mm. It's those little things that count because you, you're not doing it for you or the manager. You're doing it for Christ. Yeah. You're doing that for Jesus. You know, and that's if I could add one, think. If I could add one thing to that, I always challenge people to do hard things. I challenge people to do at least one to two sacrifices a day that they don't feel like doing. So, if, you know, washing the dishes is the last thing in the whole world that you feel like doing, then go do and wash the dishes and try to offer it up to Jesus. I mean, he died out of love for you, so maybe you could die for five or ten minutes out of love for him. But the more we do these sacrifices, the more we die to ourselves and the more we're growing closer to Christ. The more we purify ourselves, which is the, 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 the way or the root in which Christ can fill us because we're getting rid of ourselves and we're making more room for him. Exactly. No, that's exactly true. That's how you start, you know. And it's uh, it's it's not as difficult as you think. You got to start. You take little steps. You can never. You could. You know. Here's the thing. When I first got involved with, um, you know, Our Lady of Medjugorje and the whole um, charismatic renewal and all that, I was like running full steam ahead, and it was like almost a burnout. You know, I I was going so fast that it was getting ridiculous. So I had to slow down and comprehend what I was doing. Don't, you don't have to run fast. Just take it slow, but keep it steady, you know? And don't right. give up because you, you are going to fail. You're going to fall down. We're telling you right now. Don't think it's going to be like, hooray, I'm going to find Christ right away. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. Satan's going to attack you. It's going to be very difficult at times, but you know what? The more times you get tackled, the more times people try to discourage you is is a time where you should realize that you Christ is right near you, and that's that's the penance of trying to do good. You will succeed. You will convert. It's not about this earth anyways. It's about eternity. Well, that's just eternity. it. It's about a love relationship with Christ, and and that's all that comes down to is love. We do everything. Um, in our life out of love for Christ. But before we go in this show, I know you oh, wanted yeah. to talk about uh, how it. How do you become a saint? How does one declare to saint in the Catholic Church? Can you talk about that real briefly? Yeah, so this is um, an article that, that was I downloaded. It says, how does one become a saint in the Roman Catholic Church? It says, a beatification and canonization of some of the highest honors a Catholic Christian can obtain while on earth. Mother Teresa was recently declared a, a saint by the Roman Catholic Church for her miraculous healing powers in a kind heart. Isn't that interesting, Brian? You, were, you just mentioned her. Yeah. Roman Catholic saints. In Catholicism, a saint is a person who, during life, displayed God-like qualities and high degrees of holiness. The church recognizes these exceptional people by declaring them saints after death, which is achieved through a canonization process. Their lifetime achievements are used as an inspiration to congregations and a reminder of the fundamental Christian belief in living a life like the belief in Jesus Christ. Many saints are considered patron saints, which means they are dedicated to a particular issue. These issues may involve professionalism, natural disasters, locutions, illnesses, or customs. Followers of this religion seek out these specific saints and pray to them, asking that they carry a message to God. And that's important. Even your, your loved ones who die and in, 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 may be in purgatory can carry messages. Right. You, know, you should pray for them to intercede on your behalf. Going on, history of the sainthood. The first saints of Catholicism were considered martyrs of the faith due to their execution by Romans. This occurred a few hundred years after the birth of Jesus. 
by the 4th century, the religion had grown and practitioners began to recognize people who had not died for the faith but had carried out a holy-like life. Local towns honored these grave sites like those of martyrs, not canonized by the church. These saints are considered locally canonized and venerated their lives must be approved by the local bishop. By the 6th and 7th centuries, the number of people recognized for living a saintly life was nearly uncountable. Pope Alexander III criticized this criteria less practice in around 1200 AD, declared that only the Pope could determine who could become a saint. By the 17th century, the Vatican had uh, specified standards for sainthood. Standards for sainthoods. Today, naming a saint requires that several procedures are carried out. First, Candidates must be proven to be a servant of God. A bishop within the locality where the candidate passed away or was laid to rest must permit an open investigation into the virtues of their life, typically five years after death. An organized group is assigned to the case and researches any speeches and writings done by the candidate. The group writes a bibliographical uh, account of their life and interviews personal acquaintances. The local bishop then presents all the information to the Roman cura and administrative department of the church, when then assigns it to a number of a department who then further investigates the candidate. This investigation includes exhuming and examining the body. Second, the Pope declares that the candidate has heroic virtue based on the investigation and the recommendation. This is to say that the person lived a life of faith, prudence, justice, and charity. After the Pope's declaration, the person is referred to as venerable. At this stage, followers may pray to the venerable for a miracle. Third, the church makes a beatification statement which claims the deceased has been blessed with entry into heaven. If the candidate was a martyr, the Pope simply makes a statement. If, however, the candidate is a non-martyr, a miracle must take place as a result of the prayers to the venerable. Once it has been proven that the miracle was caused by God, the candidate is referred to as blessed. An additional miracle must occur before the blessed can become a saint. If something happens as a result of prayer to the candidate and the occurrence cannot be explained by medical or physical science, it is considered a prayer. Canonization. Once the candidate has achieved the previously identified standards, canonization can happen. The church issues a statement that the person is blessed with beati uh, be uh, beatific, vision. Yeah, beatific vision, the ability to communicate directly with God. Beatific, vi uh, be how do you say that? Beatific vision. Yeah, beatific vision also means that the person has achieved perfect salvation. After this statement, the church designates a day to, con to celebrate the now saint. This day is permitted to be celebrated anywhere. Followers of the saint are also permitted by the Vatican to build a church or other memorial in their honor. The end. Um, How about yeah, that? let me just sum up. There's a lot of information there. If I could just sum up for our listeners really quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Basically, in the beginning of the church, most people who were considered martyrs were considered saints. If you died for the faith, you automatically go to heaven. And actually, the church still teaches that. So if you get killed for your faith, free ticket to heaven. Good job. <laughs> um, but eventually, over the years, so many people were becoming supposedly saints that they actually ended up um, making it a nice, neat, packaged understanding of it, and they put some regulations on it in order to be something. Basically, today, it comes down to two things. Number one, they look at the life of the saint, and they look at everything they wrote, and they look at their life and see if it was holy, really holy and virtuous, you know, and whether they excelled in their, their duties to God, and they look at their writings to see if there was anything contrary to the faith or anything that might expose them or 
you know, kind of show a different side of them that nobody knew. But basically, they take everything into consideration. And if their life is holy, they still can't yet become a saint. They actually have to have, as you said, a couple of verified miracles. And these miracles, people claim miracles all the time, but these actually have to be really authenticated, a lot of times scientifically proven. For example, you know, someone who has, I believe it was Pope John Paul II, someone who had uh, Parkinson's disease, they were cured on the spot, and the doctors, multiple doctors, many doctors checked this person out, and neurologists and everyone, but this nun who couldn't even write, who couldn't drive, who couldn't even hardly get out of a wheelchair, was autom- it was instantly cured after she prayed for the intercession of Pope John Paul II, and she ended up sleeping the whole night through for the first time in years. She was able to write perfectly clearly. She was able to drive long distances and go back to working a full day. I mean, a complete and whole miracle. These are the types of miracles that the church looks for in order to help saints to, well, more to help us recognize that the saints are saints and that they are in heaven. It's more like holy confirmation. Right. And, you know, the other thing, too, that uh, because I'm thinking what the thought came to me, those who, who find themselves in, in grave sin, grave sin, right, you can go to a priest, tell the priest those sins. The priest is basically Jesus in the, in the, in the conf, con, confines of the, the uh, what do they call it, the, uh, the room that he lives in. In the person of Christ. In the person of Christ, yeah. So you're really telling Christ your sins. That that's going to start you on your way to holiness. But you have to release, get rid of that. You got to because you can't you can't follow Christ without doing forgiveness. You got to have forgiveness. You got to look at your life. You got to try to change your life. If you find yourself in the pits of hell, if you find yourself surrounded by people who are who are who are basically demonic, you're going to have to remove yourself from that. You right. have to get out of that. You can't stay and maintain or uh, try to attempt to be holy when people are, are trying to drag you down. You have to make a choice. It's like Jesus says, I, I came not to unite, but divide. Because guess what? It's your free will, your will, not God's will. God's not going to do it. You have, you have to do this. Because this century is currently being tested by Satan. And even though the article I read just said that uh, Blessed Mother crushed his head, he's still he's attacking the family. That means he's attacking each one of us. So you have, by your free will, turned to Christ, go to confession, tell the priest your prayers, you know, your sins and stuff, look for absolution. That's a forgiveness of all that. And then you can start afresh. Start afresh and new. That's what it's all about into your path to to heaven, you know? Exactly right. And I think our listeners can take away, you know, today for next week, you know, become a saint. Strive to become a saint. Don't strive, you know, to become perfect today, but take up a couple little things. What is one thing in your life? What is one fault or failing in your life that you're tired of dealing with, that you're tired of struggling with? You go to confession for it every week. St. Francis de Sales would recommend to put all of your efforts toward that sin. Let's say it's anger, you lose your temper. Well, put a lot of your prayer efforts toward getting rid of it. Put a lot of your sacrifices, offer things up so that God will help you to get rid of your temper. Offer up your holy communions, offer up your confessions for the grace to overcome your temper. See, if you put all of your effort into overcoming it and into its, fa- its corresponding virtue, which is meekness, not weakness, but meekness, then we're much more able to overcome our sins and our faults, and in doing so, we become holier and we ready ourselves for heaven. So let's think about the lives of the saints. Maybe look up some lives of the saints throughout the week and pray. Pray like a saint. Think like a saint. Think about your life and how you can live for Christ. How are you, not, how are you compromising? And what you watch, and what you look at, and what we wear, and what we listen to, and what we read. How can we purify in our life and come closer to Christ? I know we only have one minute left, but that would be my closing statements for people to think about. That's great. And I'm going to close with um, 
unfailing prayer of the Saint Anthony, and in this prayer we we can requ- request something, you know. So that'll be your choice. Whoever's listening to request this, and I'll tell you, make your, make your request to Saint Anthony to intercede for you. So the prayer goes: Blessed be God, His angels, and in His saints. O holy Saint Anthony, greatest of saints. Your love for God and charity for his creatures made you worthy when on earth to possess miraculous powers. Encouraged by this thought, I implore you to obtain for me, and here you can ask something of St. Anthony to intercede for you. O gentle and loving St. Anthony, whose heart was ever full of human sympathy, whisper my petition into the ears of the sweet infant Jesus, who love to be folded in your arms, and the gratitude of my heart will ever be yours. Amen. Amen. And with that, Brian, God bless. Have a God wonderful bless you. week. All right. Bye bye. See bye-bye. you next week. You got it. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.